Hello and welcome to State View. I'm Mark Crosby of Quincy Access Television. Thank you for joining us. State View looks at uh, legislation on Beacon Hill and um, basically tells you uh, what to expect from that legislation, how it can affect you living here in the Commonwealth. Uh, joining me today from the Norfolk and Plymouth District is Senator John Keenan. Senator, welcome back. Great. To Great to be here, Mark. Thank you. Great to have you. You almost lost your pen at the beginning I of did, the episode. I did, yes, I recovered. There. I don't know if it was caught on, uh, on camera. Um, we have uh, a couple of um, uh, bills we want to talk about today specifically, and um, both of them have uh, garnered a lot of interest. Yes. Uh, so we should, um, it will be no surprise that we are going to start with something called the Work and Family Mobility Act. Yes, this is a, a bill that ha was filed quite some time ago and has gone through several legislative sessions and really hasn't uh, had broad support. But that has changed over the last couple of years. And so there's increasing momentum to take a serious look at this legislation in this session. Uh, it was filed by Senator Brendan Crichton, who represents the city of Lynn and other communities up there. And basically, you know, people describe it as it's a, it, it would provide a license for, here, for, for people who are here without documentation. And there's a lot of debate about whether that makes sense. And we've learned an awful lot over the last several years about how well this, this program, this type of approach works in other states. And that's uh, been a new information that we've received. And you and I were speaking about um, the neighboring states of Connecticut, um, actually New York, and Vermont. 16 states plus the District of Columbia that have passed legislation that would provide licenses and they um, ha have passed them and the data has shown that it makes good public safety sense and that's been one of the biggest things that we have learned the most important things that we've learned over the last few years as a result of these states passing these laws there's been the ability to collect data and to analyze that data and to see whether this type of legislation actually protects the public and the overwhelming conclusion is that it does States have seen a pretty dramatic decrease in the number of accidents that occur, and particularly in the number of hit and run accidents that occur, uh, even as far as operating under the influence. But particularly the hit and run, because uh, this ties into public safety in another way. If somebody is in an accident and they're not licensed, they're driving illegally, they're more likely to leave a scene of, uh, of an accident. And that results in higher insurance premiums for everybody, uh, injuries that uh, somebody may be injured, and uh, it might be a bit, bit while longer before that accident's reported because somebody's left the scene. And so this legislation has shown that the number of hit and run accidents declines because people are licensed, insured, and they're driving registered cars. So they're far less likely to leave the scene of an accident. And the other So there is, they're not fearful of, of that. Um, you said that they wouldn't necessarily leave the scene of an accident, whereas uh, without this, they may fear for their own well-being, yes. I suppose, and leave because of their status as an immigrant. Correct. And so the data has shown that when they're licensed, they're driving registered cars and insured cars, and so that makes them less likely to leave the scene of an accident. And another big difference is law enforcement has looked at that data and the Big City Chiefs Association here in Massachusetts, which includes the chiefs from Boston, from Quincy, from the state police, uh, from Weymouth, I think, locally, and from a host of other uh, cities across the Commonwealth, they have come out in support of this because they feel it's safer when their offices pull somebody over for something as simple as a running through a red light or a stop sign that when they go up, there's a better chance that the person is going to have proper identification. They're going to know who they're dealing with. Absent that, they may spend quite a bit of time trying to figure out the identity of the person that they've pulled over. And so this makes that process much, much easier. They issue a citation, and again, they're issuing it to somebody who's licensed, insured, and driving a registered car. And um, that is an important element to all of this. And, um, you know, it's something that other states have done, they've collected the data, and it's pretty persuasive. I suppose if there needs to be any clarification, really uh, the amount of, um, well, the amount that we do, that each one of us does in our cars, from going to an appointment, getting a child off to school, 
Yeah, so um, we, we're on the roads a lot, more than maybe we'd like to be and more than perhaps the roads can accommodate with traffic these days. Um, but the other thing has been shown is that for, for all of us, it's safer. The more people that are on the roads have gone through the process of getting a license and driver's education uh, as, nece as d needed depending on their age and also just having passed basic driving tests and driver education. The roads will be safer. And what the insurance companies have found is that it has a positive impact on insurance rates. In the states that have passed this legislation, it has been a positive impact. And it's projected that in Massachusetts, for instance, it could uh, in, uh, result in better insurance premiums for Massachusetts drivers. And that's based on the experience of other states. And the other component that is important here that's different from in the past and uh, while well, there was a vacancy in the Transportation Committee's chairmanship, as vice chair, I, was, I took over that role in the state senate anyway. And I worked with the uh, house chair, uh, Rep Strauss. And one of the things that we really focused on in this legislation that's different than what's been done in the past is answer the question of how do we know who the person is that's applying for the license? And, to a, to, and that's a legitimate concern. How do we know who they are? They could say they're anybody and get a license now with a name on it. To get a license under this proposal, they would have to show a valid current passport or a valid current consular ID in addition to other forms of identification indicating that they actually do reside here in Massachusetts. And that's a big difference from what's been proposed in the past. So uh, for instance, the governor's uh, concern about this bill in the past has been, how do we know who they are? And the way this is drafted, it addresses that issue. If you don't have a valid passport, or valid consulate ID, uh, or the other documents, very similar documents, you're not going to get a license here in Massachusetts. Have there been similar bills that have been on the governor's desk in the past? Uh, this bill has not made it to his desk. Uh, he has expressed concern about it in the past when asked. Um, I don't know what he'd do if this bill makes it to his desk, but um, one of his big concerns has, has been addressed. Uh, looking at the House, the Massachusetts House, uh, it passed there, uh, but it seemed to be along party lines relatively so? Somewhat. Uh, I think there was some back and forth that, you know, I think, I can't remember what the final vote was, was, but it was a big enough vote that it would override a governor's veto. And that was a concern whether they would have those, that type of support in the House. In the past they haven't, but with the changes to the bill, with the data we now have, uh, the people were much more comfortable in viewing this as a positive public safety and knowing that law enforcement, many in law enforcement, not unanimous, but many in law enforcement view this as a positive public safety piece of legislation. And the other thing that's come up is people are concerned, well, if you give them a license, will they be able to vote? The answer is absolutely not. When they go to the registry motor vehicles, they will not be able to participate in the automatic voter registration program that the registry has. They have to be a citizen to vote. This does, license does not make them a citizen. Um, we have in Massachusetts and all across the country people who are not citizens, who have green cards, who are here legally, who have licenses, and they're not permitted to vote. So this would not in any way allow somebody to vote just because they've gotten a Massachusetts license. And in fact, we're moving in Massachusetts and across the country towards the federal real ID standards. And this proposal would not permit uh, somebody who gets a license under this program would not permit them to get a real ID. They I like that you brought this up because yeah. there is concern about that. Yeah, so they would just get a basic Massachusetts license, not a uh, license that complies with the uh, federal real ID requirements. So you know, they're not going to, people who get these licenses won't be able to use them to vote, won't be able to use them for real ID purposes. It will just permit them to drive and if they're driving a car of their own, that car will be licensed, I mean uh, registered and insured and um, that should result in lower insurance premiums, safer on the roads, and help our law enforcement in situations where they come across somebody who otherwise well, might not have a license. I'll have to put my glasses on for, uh, for this because I thought I, I wrote uh, large enough, but evidently not. Uh, as far as support, um, the support from the American Civil Liberties Union, the Massachusetts Immigrant and Refugee Advocacy Coalition, and a lot of local businesses, which I suppose makes sense because local businesses employ a lot of these people. Yes, uh, and you know a lot of people, they employ them, and while some work under the table, others you know, are having taxes withheld and things of that nature just for whatever reasons. Um, but yeah, they're, they're a big part of our workforce, whether we want to recognize it or not. So this bill 
in its current for uh, form has support from the Massachusetts Major City Chiefs of Police Association, which includes, as I said, Quincy, State Police, Weymouth, Brockton Police, Boston Police. It has support from the Metropolitan Area Planning Council, which is a very well-respected a quasi-public that uh, works with communities and their planning. Uh, the, you mentioned the ACLU, the Jewish Alliance for Law and Social Ac Action, Alliance for Business Leadership, Eastern Bank, the Massachusetts AFL-CIO, uh, Chambers of Commerce have supported it, other unions have supported it, the Rain Immigrant, Immigrant Center, which is formerly the Irish International Immigrant Center, um, the Irish Immigrant Center supports this, the Irish Lobby for Immigration, Boston Bar Foundation, Lawyers for Civil Rights, Massachusetts League of Women Voters, um, and then in other states where it's passed, uh, you, even the, you know, the Catholic Church has uh, indicated their support for it. So it is really broad-based support, people acknowledging that this is a public safety issue and that everybody benefits when our roads are safe, safer. Uh, not to play devil's advocate, but I guess to play devil's advocate, what were some of the reasons that, um, that folks would be against? this? Well, I can tell you, um, when I first came into the legislature, when people would ask me what my position was on the issue, my, my answer was, uh, not now. No, I don't think I would support it. And the reason was, at that time, we did not have the public safety data that we now have. And we, then there is the issue of, I felt, if you viewed this from an immigration viewpoint, and some people do, uh, I was always hopeful that our federal government would pass a comprehensive, comprehensive immigration reform package. And it has been years and years, and we're no closer today than we ever have been. And as a result, our uh, the roads are not as safe as they could be, in this, as you apply it to this particular situation. And then people think, well, you know, they're here illegally. Um, you know, they shouldn't get the privilege of driving. And, and that's, a, that's a logical argument. But unless we're going to take everybody and uh, remove them from the country, we have to acknowledge that they're here. And so if my neighbor is here without documentation and is driving now, and we're not going to remove that person from the country because they've become pretty integrated in our society, why not make sure that they're licensed, driving insured and registered vehicles? Um, and you know, in, in the bigger context of immigration, I don't hold out much hope that we're going to have comprehensive immigration reform. That would be the ultimate answer to these issues of licenses and identification. Um, and, you know, on the immigration thing, you know, will it become a magnet? Will Massachusetts become a magnet because we uh, allow, would allow these licenses? Well, 16 other states have done it. Other states are considering it. So the likelihood that somebody... We're not the first one to do this. We're not the first. So the likelihood that somebody coming from Central or South America or from somewhere in Europe all the way and thinking, I'm going to go to Massachusetts because I'm going to get a license. They've got 16 other options and probably will have, you know, another five or ten over the next several years. Right. We mentioned New York. We mentioned Washington, D.C. So clearly there are significant states that do have this in yeah, place. Yeah, and, you know, and so much today is viewed through the prism of Republican versus Democrat, red versus blue. Um, there's a mixture of states. It's kind of, there's been bipartisan support for this in other areas of the country. So it just makes public safety sense. Of course, I, Boston is an attractive place uh, for folks to visit uh, in the country. For a whole lot of reasons. <laughs> no place like home. Absolutely. I just wanted to make sure people realized I realized that. Um, next, we're going to turn to um, crime, Bill, and talk uh, about an act relative to the harmful distribution of sexually explicit visual materials. Yeah, so the governor introduced this bill. It's House Bill 4291. Um, it's been kind of known as the revenge porn bill, and it's designed or drafted to address what the governor believes, and I tend to agree, is, is a loophole. That if somebody consents to photographs, a couple consents to having photographs taken them in nude or sexual positions uh, and situations, that um, because that consent is initially given, there really isn't enough safeguards in place to prevent those photographs or those images from being posted on the internet, for instance, because that consent was initially given. And so this legislation addresses what is perceived to be a loophole, that while you may give consent to a photo, when you're in a, uh, a relationship, things change. And that consent doesn't automatically mean that you consented to it being disseminated or distributed on the Internet um, after you've broken up with a person, or even while you're still dating a person or, or married to a person. Um, so this is designed to close that loophole. And that's kind of one situation. 
Um, and then when it involves children, it, it can be devastating. I met with uh, a woman last week, a constituent of mine, and she told me the story of her 14-year-old daughter. And it is a story that um, it just beyond belief. A uh, young, young girl who was targeted by an older student and decided to share photos, knew the moment she did it that um, she would regret it, and then ultimately um, you know, was raped by this individual, and these pictures were disseminated out on the internet. Um, and you know, the, the, just a terrible story. And so this legislation is designed to address those situations where consent may have been given or pictures were voluntarily provided, um, but then become used for revenge purposes or for financial purposes uh, where the person who uh, was in those photos otherwise wouldn't have given that permission. And so it looks to address that loophole. We are such a uh, social media society uh, right now. Uh, clearly, uh, you know, laws have to be, and I, and they are, but they they have to be updated with the latest technology understood. Yes, yes. Yeah, some of the op exactly, and some of the opposition to this, or not opposition, but some who feel that there maybe isn't a need for this legislation. I feel strongly that there's a need for it. They feel that the existing statutes that maybe deal with criminal harassment could be used to prosecute these types of cases. And perhaps they can be. But my feeling is, and I think the governor feels the same way, is why not make it absolutely clear? We have a statute that specifically addresses uh, these situations. Not ambiguous. You engage in this conduct. We don't have to see whether the criminal harassment statutes maybe fit the conduct and can be used. It's pretty clear this is the statute that would apply. And isn't there a... Um an education component to this as well? Yes, if there are two minors involved and it maybe doesn't get to the stage where it's online but it might be shared in a, in a high school community, devastating obviously for the individuals whose photos are being shared, but recognition that uh, these are young people, that these mistakes are made and that there would be a diversion initially from the criminal justice system and into educational program. And it would also require educational program to the schools about the, the issues related with this type of activity. Because clearly uh, minors uh, don't have the, um, well, they're not mature enough right. to realize, you know, what, what they do from time to time. Right. Not that it makes it right, but certainly it has to be understood from that point as well. Yes. And, and the statute is, is designed and you know, will likely be tweaked to address the issues of, you know, how far is, is so far that it does require criminal prosecution, even when a minor is involved in more uh, juvenile disposition of a case as opposed to just education. You know, there are cases, and we hear about them uh, frequently, that uh, one young person may uh, take photos, send it to a boyfriend or a girlfriend, and then it might be shared among two or three or four other people. And that's really the type of activity that the diversion and education component is designed to address. If uh, that situation extends where somebody posted on the internet and, and is sharing it in that way, obviously it's a very different situation. And that's what it was with the 14-year-old the girl. Um, you know, they, they were out there and it was uh, an uncle who told her mother that, hey, this, this stuff's being shared out there. So um, really disturbing behavior and having a criminal statute that is tailored to those circumstances, I think is very important. And where does this stand right now within the Senate? It, it, uh, it's in the legislature, it's a, it's a House bill, trying to uh, bring some attention to it so that it will move forward. It was a, a bill that was filed by the governor, I can't remember exactly when he filed it this session, but he's filed it in the past in 2019 session and the 2017 session, and the bill never really moved uh, forward. And so I, I think it's time that we move forward, and anybody who would sit across from this mother and hear the story that of her family I would, would agree. And thankfully her daughter is doing, is doing as well as could be hoped, and um, as a family they, they got through this. We talked uh, right before uh, the cameras were rolling. Actually rolling, we don't roll tape anymore, <laughs> so that's an odd term. Uh, I know from the governor's office uh, came an act it's Act 4291, okay. and it's regarding, I'm sorry, it's Act 4290. 4290. We just talked about 4291, an act to protect victims of crime and the public. 
Yeah, so the governor has uh, filed this legislation. It has to do in some part with the issue of dangerousness hearings, that if somebody has committed a crime, for instance, and there are conditions uh, attached to that person's release, either pre-trial or, or post-trial, and those conditions are violated, it would streamline the process by which that individual could be brought back in and, and held. Uh, presently, there's a, a warrant situation. If somebody violates the terms of their probation, for instance, there's a, uh, I, it's been a while since I was in the district courts practicing, but there's like a surrender process, and then a warrant is issued, and the person is brought back into the court. And the governor's feeling is that that's somewhat cumbersome, burdensome, and does not uh, maybe allow things to move as quickly as they should in terms of getting somebody who's dangerous off the street. The real challenge is making sure that an individual's constitutional rights are balanced with the needs of society in terms of you know, uh, protecting the society, members of the public. And that's, that's always the, the struggle in these bills, is finding that appropriate balance where we recognize the dangerousness uh, to protect the public while also preserving an individual's constitutional rights. I believe this act does strengthen the judge's role it gives the judge, judge broader discretion so that they don't have to go through, my, uh, my recollection of the bill is they don't have to go through that warrant process, that they will be able to call somebody in and, uh, what, and I don't know if they still call it a surrender, but have that person surrendered for a violation of either um, probation or parole or whatever it may be, or pretrial condition. The last uh, subject that we're going to uh, discuss is uh, Nero's law. Talk about that, uh, how that came to be. Well, uh, we had this, the tragic situation on the Cape uh, with Officer Scannon. We had the tragic situation in, in Braintree with the officers there. And um, what happens is when, if a dog is injured in the course of saving an officer, saving a member of the public, a dog performing the duty that it's been trained to do, that the dog is injured, um, the dog would not be able to be treated on site by first responders. And so Nero's Law, uh, as a result of these tragedies, recognized that you know, there should be care on the site for these for these dogs by first responders, that they could be put into an ambulance and brought to the appropriate health care facility for, for the dog. That was not permitted before. It is now, and I think it's a, a recognition of the dangerous work that officers obviously do, that canine officers do, that the canines themselves do. And, you know, in, in the situation in, in Braintree, for instance, um, that dog is credited with, with saving the officer's life, and the dog uh, was was in the line of fire, and um, and also went after the the perpetrator, the the, the criminal, and um, that has to be recognized. And if they're hurt, then they should be uh, given the appropriate care. Because not only is it you know these dogs are trained to do this work, but they do this work within the context of uh, being a member of the officer's family. And I, I, that was kind of the, one of the motivating factors behind this as well, not only providing the care, but recognizing that they're embedded, they become part of an officer's family, they're with them 24-7. And so why wouldn't that emergency care be available in a tragic situation? Right, uh, and uh, both of these uh, circumstances, I believe, uh, obviously ambul ambulances being there uh, for the officers, but um, not being able to attend to the animal. Right, sometimes there's multiple uh, ambulances that respond to a call and the ambulance would be available. And whether it was um, uh, K-9 Nero or K-9 Kit, I mean, you know, there was enough uh, capacity there that they could have been uh, treated in, in by the first responders and then transported to appropriate medical care. So the status, uh, it's been approved by both the House and the Senate uh, headed yes, to the it, governor's it's desk. It's now law, yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, um, it is. I should double check on that. Yeah, okay. I'm pretty certain because we, it was it. Yeah, I'm pretty certain the governor signed it last week because I know it made its way finally through the legislature. But um, yeah, that's interesting. I, have I believe. To, I believe. Yes, it, I believe it is too. I believe it is too. But I'm, I'm looking at uh, actually a release from the beginning of February, so I may need to update that. Um, as we close uh, this particular program, I mean, I guess what I should say that um, there was no uh, opposition. No. In either the House or the Senate regarding this? No. Uh, there was, uh, I think it was, if I had to recall, it was probably unanimous votes in both the House and the Senate and went to the governor in that form. So, um, yeah, I think it was just a, a finally a recognition of the role that these, these dogs play in the officers' lives and in protecting the public and making sure they have the care they need. We are at uh, actually the end of the program. Uh, probably a great um, 
time to give out uh, some information uh, <coughs> to contact your office. Sure, they, uh, folks can reach us by telephone, 617-722-1494, or by email at john.keenan at masenate.gov. And then for updates, uh, we have senatorjohnkeenan.com website that people can check into, and we're regularly uh, active on both Facebook and Twitter. And we try to get as much information out there as possible for people, but we more than welcome calls and emails, and uh, we'll respond in as timely a fashion as we, as we can, which is usually pretty timely. And we should mention, too, that uh, this program, though recorded in uh, the city of Quincy, does go throughout your district, and then also beyond that, because we are talking about legislation that affects everyone who lives in the Commonwealth. Yeah, just take the first bill that we talked about, um, you know, the Work and Family Mobility Act. That will impact drivers all across the Commonwealth. It'll make our roads safer. safer. It's a, a statewide public safety initiative. And so th people should know that and hear about that. And, uh, and I, I think it's important, and I thank you for, for doing it. It's great. Well, thank you for coming in and uh, being a guest on these programs. And uh, I thank the local access stations throughout the Commonwealth that do pick up this program and continue to uh, air the series. So, Senator, thank you for coming in for this visit. Uh, we certainly welcome you back at a right. different um, day, a different time, Great. and uh, to talk about more legislation. Look forward to it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you at home for watching. Uh, please always support your local access community television station to keep programs like this coming to you.